Thanking the Most High God for the life of my brother Don Lael, Bemode Mishael, and Yisrael. And I'm grateful to the Most High God for this opportunity to stand before God's people, being that there is some so much going on in the world. Did y'all know that the, pres the, the president of Haiti got assassinated yes. last week sometime? Now that's in itself news because that's not like the general from an army being assassinated. That's the actual president of a sovereign nation in the Western Hemisphere. Turn that something in the main volume, yeah. That's something major. That's like, you don't do things like that, basically. You know, um, you've heard of coups. They usually take over a place. They house the, the sitting president. They kick him out, send him to exile. And um, that's that. You know, you heard of that. Um, in fact, I think that happened with some of the former presidents of, of Haiti. I believe Papa Doc and Baby Doc and you had all these other, but assassination is another level. Um, and then you hear about um, certain pres um, strong men in Central America were assassinated before, but it was hitting and plane crashes. You couldn't say that they were assassinated because the plane crashed. You know what I mean? This was like in the 80s and in the 70s. I believe early 80s. Um, I know Omar Torrijos. He died in a plane crash. He was a strong man um, in Panama. So his plane crashed. But most people feel like it was a conspiracy. And it, his plane was made to crash. Right? But to actually go into a, a sovereign nation with mercenaries from other countries and assassinate a, a sitting president is, is unprecedented. And um, it just shows you the times that we're living in and the things that are happening right before our eyes. It's, um, I know that Haiti, our brothers and sisters in Haiti are going through a lot. The place is, uh, you know, it's like kind of out of control. Every man kind of, every neighborhood is policing themselves and is, um, and it's sad, but our heart go out to our brothers and sisters in Haiti um, his name was Moses, too. Yav, uh, Yavnel Moise. Moise is Moses. Yavnel Mo Moise, his last name. So um, I don't know what type of man he was. I, I heard a lot of things, but I know that that's unprecedented, that you go into a, a, a um, president's home and kill him and shoot his wife and all types of stuff. So um, prayers go out to the people that are suffering, to the people of Haiti, and and to everybody that's mourning over there for what happened. Um, at this time, we're going to go to the book of Ezekiel, chapter 10. And Ezekiel is during the, once again, we in the midst of the Babylonian captivity. And the prophet Ezekiel is one of the, one of the prophets that came out during the the second wave of people that got taken away to go into Babylon. Babylon, we had three prophets that were active, like Samar Zarkar said, I believe, um, last week when he was speaking. There was three prophets that were active, which were Jeremiah, Daniel, and the prophet Ezekiel. Um, out of all of them, I believe Ezekiel might have been the youngest out of all of them. And Ezekiel was also... If we go to the beginning, I believe, of Ezekiel, I think Ezekiel was from the family of priests. Mm -hmm. And he was trying to, um, he was just trying to be a priest. <laughs> you got to think in, in Israel in those times, <clears throat> children didn't have the distractions that they have today. You don't have PlayStation, you don't have Xbox, you don't have any of those things, you know. So knowledge was... To, to study and to learn something was the most important. And the thing that a child in Jerusalem or in Israel would look up to was the priest and the temple. So the temple was like maximum. Three times a year, I go down there with Abi. We make our offering. 
and it was like you got to see everybody, and it was like, wow, look at the priest. He got his breastplate on. He, he got his, as we say today, his Sunday's best, you know, his Shabbat best. He's coming out for the holy days, and he's decked out because the Most High God said when he made the clothing for the priest, he made it for beauty and for splendor. That means that when you saw him, he looked like an important person. When he came out, that white linen, that breastplate, those jewels, it was something out of the, I mean, you're talking about gold chains and rubies and diamonds and all types of stones in his breastplate. I mean, this guy was decked out. And this was his everyday clothing. So when a child looked at that, he aspired to be like that. He was like, man, I want to be like that guy. That guy got all the jewels. So you think about a child during that period, in that era, that's what they were aspiring to be. That's what they wanted to be. Right? So Ezekiel, being from that, fight, from that lineage, he's like, he's preparing to do his job. He said, hopefully I could become a great priest. And as soon as he turned, I believe the priests from 25 years old to 30 years old, they get trained. And at 30, they begin in service and they work until they're 50. So it's a 20, just like NYC, any um, um, civil servant job in New York City, 20 years in, you could retire and you're gone. So the priest has his 20 year period. After that, at 50, he retire. He just becomes like somebody who trains, unless you are the high priest. The high priest is a lifetime job. You do it forever. So Ezekiel, just think about Ezekiel just trying to do his job, trying to be a priest. And at the age that you are supposed to be activated to become or get into the job of a priest, God said, no, uh, you're going to be one of my prophets. And I don't want you to do that because it's not going to mean anything because I'm going to destroy that place that you've been looking up to. And that place that you all been, been taking for granted and thinking that I'm dwelling in there when I don't look at a place or a person. I look at the heart of a man and whether a man is good or whether a man is bad. Most High God say he looks at the reins of the heart. He don't look at the outer appearance because the outer appearance could deceive you. So now when we think about Ezekiel, we're talking about Ezekiel is about, he went out with the second exile, so that's about 596, 596, 597 BCE, before Common Era. Daniel left in 605, about 605, 603, give or take a year or two um, um, common, um, before Common Era. And then the last exile was like um, 586 or 587, give or take a year or two. And that was when... Um, the last exiles went in there, and that was Zedekiah, and we're going to get into all of that. But that's basically the timeline of all of these prophets. And they're prophesying at different um, places. Some are prophesying in Babylon. Some are in Jerusalem. And Jeremiah was the senior prophet amongst, amongst them all. Right? So let us go to the book of Ezekiel chapter 10. We're in the book of Ezekiel. We're in the book of Ezekiel chapter 10, verse 1. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Then I looked, and behold, upon the firmament that was over the head of the cherubim, where appeared above them as it were a sapphire stone, as the appearance of the likeness of a throne. And he spoke unto the man clothed in linen, and said, Go in between the wheelwork, even under the cherub, and fill both thy hands with coals of fire from between the cherubim, and dash them against the city. And he went into my sight. Now the cherubim stood on the right side of the house. When the man went in, in the cloud filled the inner court, and the glory of Jehovah mounted up from the cherub to the threshold of the house. And the house was filled with the cloud, and the court was full of the brightness of Jehovah's glory. So this is the same vision from chapter 1. That vision that Chief Benjamin spoke about, that confusing vision of what Ezekiel saw with a wheel within a wheel, and a beast or, or, or uh, uh, something that seemed like a beast almost. It had the face of an eagle, it had the face of a kettle, it had the face of a man, and I forgot the, the face of the last one that it had. Um, but it was four faces, I'm going to mention it. So this is the same vision that we're talking about from Ezekiel chapter 1 to now. So this thing is now 
It's different. You know, it's, it's like something that gripped them because it's his imagination. Mm. It's your imagination. And you know, your imagination could run wild. Yeah. This is what God is showing him, but it's really your imagination is not really anything that you see because to this point, has anybody ever seen really a kettle bean? A, a keru, I mean, a keru bean? Not, nobody ever saw that. The only thing we ever saw was the figure of one, what somebody created, right? What was, what was the art cover and what Solomon created in the temple. So, and that was given to Moshe by the Most High God. Because at this point, no one's seeing a, a keru. Now, we get into the argument or into the discussion of what is, what are keru being? What a Sephardim and what is a Malak. So now what this society has taught us is that angels look like what? What do angels look like? Naked babies. Naked babies with wings, right? But what is translated in the Tanakh as angels, did they ever come with wings? Every time we, I mean, mo, I could be mistaken, but every time I read about an angel, it was all, he took the figure of a man. And when Yaakov, it said when Yaakov fell asleep, right? And he saw Malachim ascending and descending from a ladder, from stairs, like humans. So they took, so they took on the form, although they, was, they were um, heavenly beings, they took on the form of men, so that when they came to men, right. and, well, and, and the, the word that's translated as malakim, is, it means messenger, right. they always came with a message or with a mission from the creator. Right. We never see an angel depicted, or we never see an angel in the Tanakh, as, as I could recall, somebody with wings right. or anything they like that. Uh, right, he right. wrestled an angel and he looked, it was like a man, right? The three men that rolled up with Abraham, they were always looking like men. What they show us to be angels today is a depiction of a Western mentality. A little fluffy baby with angels' wings. And no, you know, they, they, it's like, look like some weird stuff. It don't look like. Now, Kerubim, now, when we get here, it's going to tell you, it says, the figure had the face of a human and of a Keru, Kerubim. So that means they, the Kerubim face was different. The Malachim looked like us. They came down. They looked like us. And then every now and then they did like um, what Manoah's, um, what Manoah, he did wondrously and went in the fire and disappeared. But the Most High God sent them so that we don't panic. <laughs> we can, our minds and our, and our sight can, uh, can take in what the Mosa, what's out there that the Most High God would have to show us. Yeah, it says that this, read on. Verse 5, mm -hmm. and the sound of the wings of the cherubim was heard even to the outer court as the voice of Yah Almighty when he speaks. So now it says here, and he spoke, I'm going back to verse 2, and he spoke unto the men clothed in linen, no, verse 1, then I look and behold upon the ferment that was over the head of the kettle beam, they appeared above them as it were sapphire stone, as the appearance of the likeness of a throne. So this is what he's seeing in his, in his, in, in his vision, the likeness of a throne. And he spoke unto the man clothed in linen and said, go in between the wheel work, even under the kettle, and fill both thy hands with coals of fire from between the kettle beam and dash them against the city and he went in in the sight. So now, in the, underneath the, or beside the kettle beam, there were wheels. Wheels of fire. One wheel within a wheel. So there was a wheel like this, and then there was a wheel like this. Fire. Kettle beam on one, on one wheel. Right? So he told the man dressed in linen. Now, this is all his imagination. He said, grab some of that fire. Right? And Ezekiel is, is in his imagination this is what, you know how vividly you could see a dream and you could see something and it feels so real? This is what Ezekiel, the presence of Ezekiel, God has given Ezekiel a vision. But Ezekiel's mind can't, the only way he could explain what he sees is by explaining it, by 
what he saw. Right? And it goes on and it says, verse 3, Now the Kerubim, which is more than one, right? Kerub is one, Kerubim is more than one, stood on the right side of the house when the man went in and the cloud filled the inner court. So the Kerubim went inside the house. So what he's imagining is like being in the house of, of the Most High God or in the temple. So the Kerubim went inside into the house of the Most High God. And it says, And the glory of Yehovah mounted up from the Kerub to the threshold of the house, and the house was filled with the cloud, and the court was full of the, of the brightness of Yehovah's glory. So this is what in, in rabbinic circles they would say the Shekinah, right? The glory of the Most High God. There, you're not going to find the word Shekinah in the, in the, in the Tanakh, per se. The, the root word is Shekan, which means dwell or dwelling, right? But that's what they're saying. It's like the presence of the Most High God. The Shekinah was in, in the midst of this temple, of this house that they're in, inside of. And it says that, um, and the sound of the wings of the Kerubim was heard even to the out of court as the voice of God Almighty when he speaketh. So the kettle beam, the wings was flapping so hard. Woo, woo, woo. It's almost like how you hear in a helicopter. Do, 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 And it start kicking up dust. And probably, this is probably what was happening with the kettle beam. You could hear it in the outer courts. That's how hard they were flapping. And it goes on and it says, verse 6. And it came to pass when he commanded the man clothed in linen, saying, Take fire from between the wheel work. From between the kettle beam that he went in and stood beside a wheel. Uh -huh. And the kettle stretched forth his hand from between the cherub beam unto the fire that was between the cherub beam. And took thereof and put it into the hands of him that was clothed in linen who took it and went out. So the kettle beam got wings and he got hands. <laughs> so he said he got hands like human, human hands. And he took the fire from the, from the wheel, from beside the wheel, right? And gave it to the man. That's what it says, right? Let us go. And there appeared in the terrible beam the form of a man's hand under their wings. You see? So now it said it appeared in the kettle beam like hands of a man. So if they're depicting to us that angels look like little winged figures, then what is a kettle beam? Because to me, whenever I, I look at it, kettle beam and malakim, malakim take on form of men. Kerubim looks like something totally different. It got to be. It, it, it has to because as it goes on, we're going to see. Let's go. And I looked, and behold, four wheels beside the Kerubim, one wheel beside one kettle, and another wheel beside another kettle. Uh -huh. And the appearance of the wheels was as the color of a barrel stone. Uh -huh. And as for their appearance, they four had one likeness. As if a will had been within a will. A will within a will. A will this way, a will that way. So that when this, when this thing moved, it didn't have to make any U-turns. It didn't have to turn like this. It didn't have to turn like that. It went like this. Shoop, shoop, shoop. It moved like that. Now, through the years, people have tried to say these are UFOs, unidentified flying out. But we don't know what it is. This is Ezekiel's vision. This wasn't something that he saw while he was up, while he was conscious. This is something that he saw while he was in, in a trance form. The Most High took him out of his spirit, and this is what he saw. It's not like you could say this is, you know, a, a UFO, an unidentified flying object. It is a UFO, but in your dreams. <laughs> it's not a UFO physically like how we people say, like, you know, they have sightings and Things of this nature. This is something that he saw in his vision. And he's trying to explain it the best way possible that he can. So that our human minds could be able to comprehend. And that's what he's doing at this time. Let's go. Verse 11. When they went, they went toward their four sides. They turned not as they went, but to the place where the head looked. Look, they followed it. Uh -huh. They turned not as they went. And their whole body and their backs and their hands and their wings and the wheels were full of eyes round about, even the wheels that they They backs, they eyes, they wings were full of eyes. We can't, our minds can't. If we saw that today, we will faint. If we saw, if something walked in here <coughs> looking like that with eyes all over their bodies, opening and closing, you, you're my, you, but some of us, I would reason to say that some of us will jump out the window. 
And something like that stood right there, right behind Tasania. And she looked back, she probably, she'll end up in the front row, and she do, will not want to go back down that way. Some of us would be like, open that window. I'll <laughs> take my chances jumping out the window, second story, I'm out. <laughs> because this is something that we can't comprehend. Right. Our minds can't take this. So Ezekiel is trying to explain it as best way possible. Let us go. As for the wills, they were called in my hearing the will work. And everyone had four faces. The first face was the face of the kettle, and the, the second first face, face was the face of the what? Of the kettle. Of the kettle. Of the of the kettle. Let's go. And the and the second face was the face of a man. Of a man. So if a kettle is a man, right. then why would they have different faces? Malak right. Malak or Malakim come in the form of a man. To until they reveal themselves, you don't know that what they are. Right. When they when they came to um Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, Lot thought he was just bringing men into his house. House guests? Yeah. And they said that they caused blindness to come upon the people. Mm. And told him and his family, get out of here because yeah. we got to take care of this place. Yeah. But the Kerub is something totally different. I don't know what it is. I know that God gave Moses the instruction on how to build it and to put it over the, uh, the ark cover. And that Solomon built them in his temple. Yeah. But that was uh, something that God gave Moses. So we don't really know what that is. Right. Said so their wings just stretched out over and they touched each other right over the ark cover. That's all we know. That's but it. we don't know the facial features or, or how they look. Let's go. And the third, the face of a lion. Lion, and that was the animal. And the fourth, the face of an eagle. And the fourth, the face of an eagle. Let's go. And the kettle being mounted up, this is the living creature that I saw by the river Kovar. Mm -hmm. And when the kettle being went, the wheels went beside them. And when the carabine lifted up their wings to mount up from the earth, the same wheels also turned not from beside them. That's right. There you go. The, these things was like moving in sequence. Like it was something that he never saw before. Let's go. When they stood, these stood. And when they mounted up, these mounted up with them. Uh -huh. For the spirit of the living creature was in them. The and spirit the of the living creature was in them. He couldn't even explain what it was. He said, just the spirit of a living creature was in them. Let's go. And the glory of Yehoah. Went forth from off the threshold of the house uh -huh. and stood over the kettle beam. And the, 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 the spirit of Yehovah, what that cloud, what they call that Shekinah, went over, came up from what and went over what? Uh -oh. and, went, and stood over the kettle beam. And stood over the kettle beam. That God is, is like almost like God is giving a, a message, right? <laughs> I'm not with y'all no more. I'm going to be with my, with my, with my heavenly beings. Right? This is what he's seeing in his, in his vision. Let's go. And the cattle beam lifted up their wings and mounted up from the earth in my sight when they went forth. And the wheels beside them. And they stood at the door of the east gate of Jehovah's house. And the glory of Jehovah's house. And the glory of the God of Israel was over them above. Was over them above. Let's go. This is the living creature that I saw under, under the God of Israel by the river Kabar. Kabar. This is down in Babylon. Let's go. And I knew... That they were Kerubim. And I knew that they were Kerubim. Something that he never saw before. Malakim, like I said, they come in the form of men. And, and you know that they you know that they messengers when they make themselves known to you. Who was it that it was it was the one that Jacob was wrestling with when he asked him, What's your name? Yeah. And he said, Why is it that you ask my name, seeing that it's secret? Right. He said, Bless me. And that's when he got the name Yisrael, right? Yes, he said, he said, let me go. He said, your name should no longer be Yaakov, but your name shall be Yisrael. Mm -hmm. For thou hast striven with man and God and what? Yeah. Has prevailed. He said, he touched the what? The hollow of his thigh. Mm -hmm. Because Yaakov had him. Yaakov had him. He wasn't letting him go. Strong. He was strong. So it was something that, Malachim it was something that at least... Yaakov was able to contend with, but he didn't want to hurt Yaakov. But he had to, tap, he had to make him tap out because it, he came for his mission and it was time to go. And Yaakov wouldn't let him go. He said, you're going to have to bless me because I know this is something different here. You know what? It, to wrestle for two minutes, to wrestle for two minutes, you tired. You tussle for two, three minutes, you tired. Imagine to tussle all night. To the break of dawn, you tussling with somebody. 
and you're not letting them go and you just got them in a lock and a headlock and they got two and and then this Malakim finally this Malak finally said that Malak finally said Bop! oh because he said he wouldn't let him go and he changed his name <laughs> he let him go you know so these are the, the different type of um, heavenly beings that we're dealing with, and we don't understand it. We try to understand it. We try to put faces on it, and we can't let mankind put an image on it. Now, I could be wrong, but from what I could remember, I, I never really remember Malachim coming with wings. Right. I don't remember that, you know, but I could be wrong. You know, it's just an observation. Let's go. 21. Mm -hmm. Everyone have four faces apiece. And every one four wings. And the likeness of the hands of a man was under their wings. And as for the likeness of their faces, they were the faces which I saw by the river Kabar. Uh -huh. Their appearances and themselves, they went every one straight forward. Everyone went straight forward. So they didn't need to like change direction, like put the face of the man right. on this side so that he could go. No, it was if it was facing, if they had to go to the face where the, the man is the man's face is facing, that's the way it went. If they had to go to the face, to where the eagle face is facing, that's the way they went. Or where the lion face, that's the way they went. Or where the kettle, that's the way they went. That's why the wheels, what's within the wheel, wheel like this, and inside of it another wheel. So it could go north, south, east, or west. It just moved like that. Mm -hmm. That's how it moved. That's in his, in his imagination, that's what he saw. Verse um, chapter 11, my brother. Then the spirit lifted me up and brought me unto the east gate of Jehovah's house, which looked for eastward. And behold, at the door of the gate, five and twenty men. And I saw in the midst of them, Yaazniah, the son of Azor, and Pel Pelatiah, the son of Benaiah, princes of the people. And he said unto me, son of man, these are the men that devise iniquity. Uh -huh. And I give wicked counsel in this city that say, the time is not near to build houses, this city is the cauldron, and we are the flesh. Therefore, prophesy against them. Prophesy, O son of man. So this is the now, in his vision, he's seeing actual men uh -huh. that that are leaders of the city. <laughs> and these men, and he said unto me, Son of man, these are the men that devise iniquity and that give wicked counsel in this city mm -hmm. that say the time is not near to build houses. This city is a cauldron, and we are flesh. Right. Therefore, prophesy against them, prophesy our son of man, saying like, the city of Jerusalem is a, it's a pot, it's a, it's a pot, a cauldron, right? And we are the flesh, meaning like, we're going to cook here. We're going to die here. They're going to burn us up here. Now, remember, when we read in Jeremiah, the Most High God said that the first wave of people were actually the good people. The actual... First wave that left out Babylon into captivity, God told them, build houses in Babylon uh, and pray for the good of the city and that those people were actually the good people. The people that stayed back thought that they were good and that the ones that went into exile were the bad ones. So they started bad-mouthing the ones that went into exile, like saying, like, you see, the Most High God took them away and they wicked and they evil. These are the wicked, as they say, suckers here. These guys right here, the ones that gave the bad advice to the princes and that caused the people to go astray. Not the first wave. The first wave of people were the innocent ones. They were the good people. They said those were the, those were the, the figs that were not rotten. The ones that stayed back were the rotten figs. <laughs> but they thought in their minds that they was good because God didn't spew them out of the land. But actually the good ones was the ones that left. Those were the ones that God showed mercy to. They went to Babylon, built houses, and they had their 70 year prison sentence. And after 70 years, the ones that were alive came back. Mm -hmm. When um, Cyrus delivered them from the hands of Babylon, but the other ones, they died. Let's go. Five. And the spirit of Yehovah fell upon me, and he said unto me, Speak, thus saith Yehovah. Thus have he said, O house of Israel. I know the things that come into your mind. I know the things that come into your mind. Now, this is all in his vision now. It's still in his vision. Uh-huh. Ye have multiplied your slain in this city, and ye have filled the streets thereof with the slain. You hear that? These same wicked people 
was slaughtering the same children of Israel. Mm -hmm. He said, you will multiply the, 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 um, the, 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 the death of the people in the, in the city. What he said here, you'll multiply your slain in this, in this city and you have filled the streets thereof with the slain. So when you're in a position of power and you massacre people or you kill people and you do things like that, God doesn't overlook those things. He doesn't overlook those things. Let us go. Therefore, thus saith your whole God, your slain whom ye have laid in the midst of it, they are the flesh. And this city is the cauldron, but ye shall be brought forth out of the midst of it. Ye have feared the sword, and the sword will I bring upon you, saith Jehovah God. All right. And now, so right here where it says, we were discussing this earlier because I noticed that in the Hebrew. Now, for most part, when we see um, the name Lord, right? Now, when you see Lord here, it's really saying Adonai. Right? Because usually when it's Yehovah, it will be, everything will be in capital. L-O-R-D. Everything will be in, ca in capital letters. But when you see it like this, L-O-R-D, capital L, and everything else is lower in lower case, it's saying Adonai. For thus saith um, Adonai, um, and then now you see God in all caps. You see it here? God, God in all caps. Mm -hmm. That's actually, when you read it in the Hebrew, it says like, um, no, it's a, it, Yehowi. That's what it says. So now it's a different pronunciation of Yehovah, it's not saying Yehovah, it's saying Yehowi. I was asking my brother Samar Zakar, and he said that's just basically like the way they were writing at that time, you know, coming out of Babylon, so forth and so on. But I saw that, and I, it stood out to me because whenever you see the word God or Elohim, it, will, it wouldn't be all in cap. It would just be G-O, capital G, and everything else is in lower, lower, um, lower um, caps, or O-D will be in lower, and it will say Elohim. And it will say Elohim, Elohim. But when I see G-O-D all in caps, it says Yehowi. It doesn't say Yehovah. And, and the language switches from one to the other within the same chapter. So I don't know if that's the way that Dan, um, Ezekiel was talking about or expressing himself about the Most High God. Maybe a nickname, but I was speaking to my brother Samar Zakhar and he was just saying basically that was the way you know, sometimes coming out of Babylon, you get certain things caught up and you get certain things mixed in. But for whatever it is, it was just an observation. It's not nothing for us to kill ourselves over, but it's just a little observation just in case. If you look at it, when you see the capital G-O-D, that's saying actually in Hebrew, Yehoi. Let's go. Nine, and I'll bring you forth out of the midst thereof and deliver you into the hands of strangers and will execute judgments among you. You shall fall by the sword. I will judge you upon the border of Israel, and you shall know that I am your whole. So you see, now the Most High God is speaking about what we read about. So he said, I will judge you in the borders of Israel. Now that was actually King Zedekiah. Now if you remember the story of King Zedekiah, right, when we read it in Jeremiah, he, when, ba when the Babylonians came into the city of Jerusalem, when they breached the walls of Jerusalem, he went out through the back door. They actually made a breach in the wall and they left out in the night. Him and all the princes, they left out in the night. And the Most High God caused the, the, um, the, the Babylonian soldiers to catch him. And they brought him unto, I believe, Jericho, where um, Nebuchadnezzar was. They brought him up to Jericho, right? And there, the princes were slain. And go on. We're going to get to the story. Though this city shall not be your cauldron, you shall be the flesh in the midst thereof. I will judge you upon the border of Israel, and you shall know that I am your whole. Uh -huh, you shall know that I am your whole. Let's go. For ye have not walked in my statue. In other words, you're not going to die here. You already slain the people, right? The innocent people. You shed innocent blood. You're not going to die here, right? You're going to be, you're going to die in another land. Let's go. For ye have not walked in my statutes, neither have ye executed my ordinances, but have done after the abominations of the nations that are round about you. This is very important. You have not walked after my order. What it says here, and, and ye shall know that I am Jehovah, for ye have not walked in my statutes, neither have you executed my ordinances, but ye have done after the ordinances of the nations that are round about you. That is today. 
also. We do everything that everyone else is doing. That's contrary to the laws of God. We go around, we tag up ourselves, we put tattoos on our flesh. We, um, we think that um, sex is a sport. We begin to do every and anything that the nations do so that we could walk and fit with everyone else. And God despises that. We begin to try to fit in and conform to this society and, and, and act like God understands us and understand our plight. You begin to take on the ways of the heathens and then that begins to deteriorate the fabric of what an Israelite is. We understand everything. Nothing stands. Like, nobody takes a stand on anything. Right. Two, three years go past, people forget about certain things, yeah. and then everything is good. Yeah. Everything is hunky-dory. We don't, oh, you don't remember what that person did? Right. Oh, but that was three years ago. We got to forget and forgive. How do you, how you feel that way? That you got to forget and you got to forgive. Yeah, you forget and forgive with certain things, but there are certain things, like Moe and Moe Mishael used to say, that are high crimes. That's right. That's a fact. That's, that's right. And you are a criminal. That's right. That's it. People love, people, listen, Israelites, I've seen them for years, they love the people that do wrong. That's a fact. They are exciting. You know why? Because no one stands up and says, get out of here, monkey. <laughs> get out of here. You're not accepted here. And what happens? They come in the midst of us. Uh -huh. They spread their ways. Uh -huh. and, it and it spreads. And then our children, our children are the ones affected by it. Because we accept everything. And we okay everything. And no one stands up and say that's wrong. And get out of here with that. No one stands up and says that. And this is what's killing us as a whole. As a community. As a people. People have to have the chuspah. Uh -huh. The cojones. Uh -huh. To say it's wrong. And then when people say it's wrong, you begin to talk about, oh, come on, we're going to go into that again? What do you think the prophets had to go through? You think the prophets like going before the people and telling them over and over again that they were wrong? But guess what? They had to do a job. If you stand in the midst of the people, congregations, you have to tell the people the truth. Because the Most High God eliminated the prophets that were telling the people sweet things. That's right. oh, yeah. It's like, I don't agree with everything he said, but he's, he's kind of, what's the brother's name, Kevin Samuels? Yeah. Yeah. He be telling some, he be telling some sisters the truth. Right. And they don't want to hear the truth. But, they, but sometimes, the first thing they do is say he's a faggot. He's a homosexual. Like, that's, did you hear what the man said? That's the first thing they say. You know? That's the first thing they say. Well, sometimes he say things, I'm like, okay, that makes sense. I don't mean I agree with everything he say, but I'm like, all right, that makes sense. I understand his analogy behind what he's saying. He's making good points. But people don't want to hear the truth. <laughs> he told his sister, he said, he said, now, you say you want a man that, yeah, yeah, you want a high value man that's going to do this, that's going to do that, that's going to do, what you bring to the table? He said, at best, you are four and a half. I said, what? He told him. I was like, it's like, he said, he said, at best, you are a four and a half. I, he said, you built like a, he said, she, he said, how heavy are you? She said, I'm 220. He said, you a fullback in the NFL. That's right. 
He said, Emmett Smith is 220 pounds. That's right. And then he had to go back and say, I, I, I was wrong. Emmett Smith is like a 200 pounds. It was, it was crazy, but it was a reality check, right? It doesn't mean that a big woman, full-figured woman is not beautiful. It didn't mean that, but her, what she was, what the things that she was saying, he had to kind of like bring her back to like almost a reality. Like, hey, sis, you, you, you know what I'm saying? Like, what you asking for, you, you looking for, you look, as they say, you looking for, for, for Abraham and you not a Sarah. Uh-oh. You got to be a Sarah if you want to find Abraham. Or work towards being a Sarah. Or you got to be an Abraham if you want to find a Sarah. I'm not shooting any, but it's just reality checks. So a lot of times people don't want to tell the truth about what's going on and who people are. No, that's my sister. No, that's my cousin. No, that's my daughter. Get out of here. Wrong is wrong. Why you think them laws is there? It hurts you, but you got to tell when wrong is being done. Amen. You see your, your siblings doing something wrong and you just okay it? It says silence is like agreement. Yeah. Didn't it say that in last week's lesson? It is. It is. They said if you hear your daughter make a vow and time lapses and you heard the vow uh -huh. and then Time go past and you want to stop the vow and say, you can't do that. So, Because when you first heard it, you said nothing. That means that the vow is good. That means when you sit there and you see wrong, and you allow wrong to happen and you say nothing, it's like saying, right on. That's a fact. Talk to me. That's a fact. Talk to me. Talk to me. Got all types of stuff going on. People act like ain't nothing happening. People cover their eyes. People sit down, lay back, yeah. do nothing. And, and the wrong keep going on. And the wrong festers. Till it hits your home. Go down that road. They don't listen. Why? Because you left the wrong in the midst of you. You didn't kick it away swiftly. How are you going to repair something that God don't even want to repair? How are you going to repair something that God doesn't even want to repair? He said, I have planted a righteous vine, a righteous seed. He said, but up came up a degenerate vine. That means he was rejected. People don't like this type of talk because it sounds too harsh and, it's, and it sounds too radical. But it's the truth. He said he planted a righteous vine, a, a righteous seed, but up came up a degenerate vine. Degenerate means that it's no good. When they call you a degenerate gambler, you know what that means? You're no good. You're de de you degenerate. That means that de when you sit down and gamble, you, you could be up a million dollars and you're going to bet that million dollars until you lose it. That's a degenerate gambler. Can't move from the table. You up, you up, you came, you up, you up a million dollars. But the table, the chair has a magnet and your behind has metal and you can't get up. That's a degenerate. That means you do harm to your own self. Uh -huh. yeah. That's what God said. You're a degenerate. We became idolatrous. Uh -huh. You know what's the difference between an idolater? An adulterer, when the Most High God calls us the both. Right. An adulterer at least keeps God. Right? Uh, he still has the Most High God. But he's sneaking around the corner. Okay. It's, it's, like, it's like when we read about the, the, the Midianitish um, woman, where we went and, and we went and we, we partook of the, the whole thing with Baal, Peor, right? It's not that they gave up on Yah. But it's like, oh, this sounds good too. Let me go around the corner. An idolater, just the heck with God, this is my God. Yeah, this is my God. This is who I worship now. Jesus, I love him. 
Yes. Yeshua. Jesus, Yeshua, Joshua, whatever you want to call them, is all the same. Garbage. Yahweh Shai. Garbage. Because God is one. Yah is one. He says, Shema Yisrael, Yahweh Eloheinu, Yahweh what? Ekad. One. The oneness of the Creator. He doesn't mingle himself with anyone. So we have adopted the, the ways of all the nations round about us and we walked in it and been comfortable in it. And we as Israelites, when those people come around us, we don't say, yo, don't come around me with that man. You got to go. Yeah. We embrace, we hug, we kiss. You might see a brother... Now, we're not saying you reject everybody that you see, but you see a brother fell down, tell him what's right. Because you might wake him back up. Tell her what's wrong. You might wake her back up. Freaking girl walking out there with Bati Riders. Uh -huh. Huh? Daisy Dukes, if you don't understand what that is. Mm -mm, shorts. Right, right. Oh, shalom, shalom. She don't get no shalom. None. <laughs> so hold on. Where you been, sister? Hold on. Don't give me no hug. Know what you've been into. What's going on with you? Why are you dressed like that? That's right. Why? Why are you looking like that? Right. Why is it that you um? That you felt like this. What's good? Talk to me. Maybe I, maybe I can help you. I'm not telling you you reject them because you might be able to help them. But what happened? But you got to be able to be the messenger. Because if you're not the messenger, then what are you? You're just living in this life. Messengers of, God's, it was, of God, it was never easy. There was always a message you had to bring. There was always you had to let somebody know that they were wrong. People don't want to. People don't want to hear it. People don't want to be involved in that because it's scary. Because you want to be cool with everybody, but you can't be cool with everybody. Because your friends are supposed to be those that do the same thing that you do. You got acquaintances. You got to go to work. Yeah. You got people outside of, of 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 Torah that you got to interact with on a daily basis. But your friends are supposed to be those who live like you. Sometimes your own family is not your friend. I repeat that. Sometimes your own family is not your friend. Talk to me. Let's go. Verse 13. I know I went way off, but. And it came to pass when I prophesied that Pelatai, the son of Benai, died. Then fell I down upon my face and cried with a loud voice and said, Ah, Yehovah God, would thou make a full end of the remnant of Israel? So now Ezekiel is like, man, you going to kill everybody? Are you going to kill everybody, the whole remnant? But let's see what the Most High God says. And the word of Yehovah came unto me, saying, Son of man, as for thy brethren, even thy brethren, the men of thy kindred, and all the house of Israel, all of them, concerning whom the inhabitants of Jerusalem have said, Get you far from Yehovah unto us is this land given for a possession. Uh -huh. Therefore say, thus saith Yehovah God, although I have removed from them far off among the nations, and although I have scattered them among the countries, yet have I been to them as a little sanctuary in the countries where they are come. Uh -huh. Therefore say, thus saith Yehovah God, I will even gather you from the peoples and assemble you out of the countries where you have been scattered. And I'll give you the land of Israel. Uh -huh. And they shall come hither and they shall take away all the detestable things thereof and all the abominations thereof from thence. Uh -huh. And I'll give them one heart and I'll put a new spirit within you and I'll remove the stony heart out of their flesh and will give them a heart of So flesh. those are the people that went into Babylon. God said he's going to preserve them and he's going to bring them back and he's going to destroy all of the idols out right. of the city of Jerusalem. Because the city had to be purged. Right. 
because of the evil that was happening right in the gates of the city in the temple people was was putting up idols and worshiping idols God had to get rid of all of that he had to purge it let us go that they may walk in my statutes and keep my ordinances and do them and do them which is the most important thing is is one thing to know something it's one thing to to see something and then the, but to do it is something totally different. We have to walk in this. Not just talk it, we got to walk it. We have to walk it. This has to be your life cuz this will govern your life. You you wait for something in life to help you out and and you think you're missing out on things in life and then you get out there and you see that there's nothing out there for you. That's right. Take my word, there's nothing out there for you. Yeah. Right now in New York City, New York City is so hot, hot. that every other, every day, every day, every day, young people are killing each other. That's a lack of understanding and a lack of wisdom. Now use your power to bring those people in and bring them understanding. Or else our children will fall into that. Look at Chicago. They said in Chicago there was one rapper by the name of King Vaughn. They said he was the one who killed a 15-year-old girl who was a known, a known murderer. 15-year-old girl that was known to kill people. So he killed her. He's 17. He killed her because she was about that life. Uh -huh. So he felt like he had to kill her, but then somebody killed them. So this is what we, our kids is living in the midst of, the ignorance. That you bump into someone, and even if you say, excuse me, it, do, it doesn't mean anything. It's like the story you told me with the young brother that was walking. He bumped into the other guy. He told the guy, excuse me. And he was with his friends and girls, so they want to show off. Man, F you. Ba 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 ba. This, that, and the other. Da, 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 da. And the guy said, I said, excuse me. I'm right. sorry. I'm walking away. But they kept pressing the guy. The guy, the little pouch. Uh -huh. You know, the infamous little pouch, the little fanny pack. Guy came out of the fanny pack That's right. and plugged them, plugged all of them. Kill one of them. This is what we're living in. But if we don't use the wisdom that the Most High God gave us to forsake anger, right. to use wisdom, the Proverbs, it says, it says, it used to be a, a proverb that we, it said, you run to fight to see another day. That's right. Sometimes you got to run. Or oh, something like that. I don't know how it goes. <laughs> But I remember it was like, get up and run so you can fight to see another, to live another day or however the proverb go. But, yeah. You got to run. Sometimes you got to get on your best flight. <laughs> Wisdom. <laughs> it doesn't make you a punk. It doesn't make you any of those things. It just makes you smart. Strategic. I'm living for another day. Let's go. And they shall be my people. And I will be their God. It says what? And they shall be my people, and I will be their God. Mm -mm. What verse was that? That was the end of 20. The end of 20, it says, And I'll give them one heart, mm -hmm. and I'll put a new spirit within you, and I'll remove the stony heart out of thy flesh, and will give them a heart of flesh. It's going to take away that hard, that hard heart that we got right now, uh -huh. and will give us a heart of flesh. Why? Because it says that when the Most High God, he makes a new covenant with us, it says he will write it in our inward parts. Right. The new covenant is not the New Testament. Like Christianity has taught us that the New Testament is the new covenant and that Jesus is the, is the suffering lamb or the sacrificial lamb. That's not the new covenant. The new covenant is that God will once again renew that covenant that he made with Abraham and said that he will give us a heart of flesh and that he will write within the walls of our minds and our heart the Torah that we don't have to teach it one to another again. 
I believe you could find that in the book of Jeremiah, either chapter 31, fleece me right now, but I think it's Jeremiah 31, but the Most High God speaks about the new covenant, mm -hmm. and he will give us a heart of flesh, and we won't have that stony heart to where we be harsh one with another. We're going to love and care for one another, but loving and caring come with keeping Torah. We have to keep Torah. We can't go outside of the Torah because that's going to get us killed. When we do things that are contrary to the creator, it shows how much we hate him. You know what hate is? Yeah. Hate is that you just, when, you, when you love somebody or when you love something, you don't do anything to harm it. You got a chain. You care for your chain. You got real gold. You put it in a safe place. Why? Because you don't want anyone to steal it. You, you polish it. You clean it. You do whatever it is that you got to do. You got a favorite pair of clothing that you have. You put it in the cleanest. You're not putting it in the spin cycle. You put it in the dry cleanest so that it doesn't fade. So that whatever it is, you love someone, you love hard, you, you care for them, you, you don't want to see them hurt. So you're there for them. But when you start doing the opposite of that, you don't love them. Oh, so the Most High God is saying, like, listen here, man. Y'all don't got, you know what I mean? Y'all had no love for me. Right. But now this new heart that I'm going to give you is going to be a loving heart so that you can love one another and first and foremost love me. Right. Let's go. But as for them whose heart walketh after their uh, detestable things and their abominations, I will bring their way upon their own heads. Say your whole God. So I'll bring their ways upon their own heads. Right. All the Creflo Dollars, yep. all of the TD Jakes, all of these people that lead God's people astray, God is going to have something for them. You see, we can't get caught up on numbers. Israel is never going to be more than everybody than anyone else. Amen. So God said he didn't pick us because we was the, the mightiest and the most of our all nations. Wow. He said he chose us, he said, because... He said he chose us. He said we was the least amongst all nations. So for the love that he had for Abraham, right. his friend, right. is why he chose us. Right. And made us his darling, upright. Amen. You're sure. Why he made us that people. Why he loved the zeal that, that David had, and although David had too much blood in his hand, he said, I see your heart. Oh, yeah. That's what he, said. he said, but you can't do it, son. He said, you got too much blood in your hand. He said, but I'm going to let your son do it. Oh, yeah. And David was able to rest in peace knowing that Solomon, David didn't ask to see the beginning. Oh, God, can I at least see the beginning of the building? None of it? He ain't asked for none of that. They, David was like, I'm happy with that. Right. Told I, yeah. And you know what I'm going to do? When I go to these wars and I go and I do all this stuff and I collect all this gold and all that stuff, I'm going to make sure I leave all the material. I'm going to leave the plans so that this boy, so my, my fingerprints will be on it. That's right. Solomon needed nothing. nothing. His father left him everything. That's right. What do you think? Although Solomon was called, considered the, the, the wisest man that ever lived, you thought that the, the wisdom, where it came from? His father. That's right. He had to have a wise father. Maybe he surpassed his father in wisdom, but David had to be wise. And when David had Solomon, he was already an old guy. He was older, advanced in age. He wasn't going out to war. So he got a chance to sit with Solomon. And when you read those Proverbs, you hear David talking about what his father was telling him. We was telling him about women. Stay away from the strange woman. From the alien woman. For she will call you on the, on the night and tell you. And said, the man of the house, he's gone. He's gone. He's gone to the next new moon. He's saying, you go in there and that becomes your grave. 
It's not saying that you, you die physically, but spiritually because you touched another man's wife. So that becomes your grave. Adultery. Talk to me. Let us go. Then did the Kerubim lift up their wings, and the whales were beside them. And the glory of Yah of Israel was over them above. And the glory of Yahweh went up from the midst of the city, and stood upon the mountain which is on the east side of the city. And the Spirit lifted me up, and brought me in the vision by the Spirit of Yah into Chaldea, to them of the captivity. So the vision that I had seen went up from me. Then I spoke unto them of the captivity, all things. See God, uh, then I spoke unto them of the captivity. All the things that Yehovah had shown me. Hallelujah. 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 So you see in the vision, it's a progression, right? In the house, and the, the, the east gate of the house. And now, that thing is all the way on the hill. It left. The Shekinah, the spirit of God, or the, 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 the spirit of the Most High God has left the city. It says up on the hill. And it's going, and it's going way away from there. Why? Because the people are not doing good. So, so when you're not doing good, the spirit of God departs from you. God don't dwell in the midst of filth. Nope. God told the man, he said, he said, he said, when you go out to battle, when you go out to war, he said, and you got to take a, a crap. Right. So that we understand that you got to go and relieve yourself. Right. It says, put a paddle at the end of your weapons. Wow. So that when you have to relieve yourself, that you make a hole, you relieve yourself, and you cover it. He said, because I walk in the midst of the camps of Israel. He said, and I don't walk in the midst of uncleanness. Wow. We're talk, we, we talking about a, a, a clean God. A God who don't want any uncleanness in the midst of you. I speak to my Isha. I say, Isha, these babies, when they, when they make Zoak, let's put these pampers in plastic bags and take them outside. Why? Because God don't, if he don't dwell in the midst of uncleanness, right? The Zoak pamper, sometimes you leave it in the house and you forget. Yeah. And when you come in, even in the plastic bag, you say, what the heck done died in here? Right. You start looking and you remember the pampers and the, and the plastic bag that you forgot to take out. Yeah. So God enters there? Think about it. But I say he don't come in the midst of uncleanliness. He don't come in the midst of, of unholiness. So how is it that we accept everything within the midst and, and our walls and everything is good? Right. And we see certain things and events and things that are happening and everybody is hunky-dory and, and everybody, you know, thinks that, that, that everything is okay. Is it really okay? Nope. Is God accepting that, that, um, that thing that you're doing? No way. Man, there's so many things that you want to say, man. Yeah, I know. There's so many <laughs> things you want to say. But this is God's day, and I'm trying to keep it in a way where, you know, I'm keeping it in God's day. But I hope it says, it said, it said a hint to the wise is sufficient. It said a hint to the wise is sufficient. So I hope that you're listening to what I say. People, you can't, you can't support wrong. You can't support wrong. We all make mistakes. We all stump our toes. I'm not saying that we don't make, we all in here have made mistakes. Yes. We have all stumped our toes. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the continuous sinner that you know. No. And you accept them in your bosom. And guess what's going to happen? They're going to do the same thing that they did to the previous person, that they did to the person before, and that they did to the person before. Because he planted a righteous seed, but up came up a degenerate vine. That, that vine is degenerate. And if God can't repair it, why you think you're going to be able to repair it? 
Sometimes we let brothers and sisters go down into the slaughter because we don't be, we don't be fervent enough to let people know what's before them. So we accept it. What do you think a snake does? Snake bites. If it has poison in it, it's going to put that venom in you. So if you take a, a snake to your bosom, eventually it's going to do what? It's going to act in character. It's going to bite you. See, what was the ringling and who was the, the Barnum and, and what was the? Siegfried and Roy. They've been raising these tigers for like this. Little cubs. Little cubs. Little baby cubs. Tiger, sign me, uh, what was it, like albino tigers or whatever they was. And he thought he could, huh, 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 huh. Tiger said, man, I'm tired of this. Bah! Dead. Raise them up from baby. Go back to your nature. A snake is a snake. You take it to your bosom, eventually it's going to get you. We don't need to be around snakes. I hope that you've gotten the message. I pray that the Most High God be with us all. And I pray that the creator of, earth, of heaven and earth will give us all that part of flesh so that we might be able to take in the laws, the statutes, and commandments of the creator. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.